Tuesday, January 28, 1975. A Swiss farmer named Edward Billy Meyer takes a series of photographs of what he is later told is a beam ship from the Pleiadian star system. These photographs were the focus of the most exhaustive investigation into the UFO phenomena ever. During the following five years, the evidence continued to accumulate. And it was this extensive physical evidence that nudged the curiosity of Nippon television director and investigative reporter Junichi Yaoi, prompting he and his team to join us in October 1979. Having been involved in the research and responsible for the investigation for over 18 months, we welcomed the fresh input. Our team, Wendell Stevens, Tom Welch, myself, Britt Elders, and Lee Elders, had been impressed by the sincerity and openness of the contactee, Edward Billy Meyer. During our five previous visits, he had always been willing to work with us, answering what must have seemed an endless barrage of questions and ushering us across the Swiss countryside to the numerous contact sites. His Greek wife, Calliope, spoke no English, yet was a gracious hostess, allowing us free reign into her family's private world. And the Maya children recounted their UFO sightings with the exuberance of any other child showing off a new toy. At that time, Billy was struggling to become a self-sufficient farmer. With the help of friends, he was busy turning a run-down piece of property into something livable. He and his family were surviving on 830 Swiss francs a month, paid to him because he had lost a left arm in a bus accident in 1963. Still, this handicapped farmer, with only a sixth grade education, had taken over 800 of the clearest photographs ever seen of extraterrestrial spacecraft. The beam ship photographs, eight millimeter movie footage, metal specimens, and recorded sounds of the craft had spurred our investigation, and now would become the two year focus of Junichi and his crew. Mr. Mayer, now could you tell me about? Could you tell us about your, how uh, were you involved in the UFO? You see, that's a very long story. Yes. It begins at 1942 mm -hmm. in my birth town, called Spilach. There, on a nice day, a summer day. I had something seen like a flash out of the sky. Was it night? No, it was like a silvery flash. And a piece of a second later, that flash came very near, mm -hmm. very close to my father and me. Mm -hmm. We were staying behind the house. Uh, how, old, uh, how old was it? Uh, five years old. Uh -huh. And then I have seen, it isn't a flash, it was a very, very big disc. And from that time, I got some contact, some telepathic way, mm -hmm. and about that I was afraid. Mm -hmm. And I was running to our village priest, to ask them what's happened with them, because I was thinking I will come crazy or foolish. And then he told me what's happened about telepathy. And I got into my head something like a voice who was teaching me on several things. And what they told me, I shall not be afraid. And then some time later, month later, I saw a second ship when I was far outside from our village. 
Then it came down, sit on, on the ground, and then came out a uh, very, very old man. I was thinking about 90, 95 years old. Mm. And he took me into his bowl, metal bowl. Mm -hmm. It was a, a spaceship. Mm -hmm. And took me up about 70 kilometers over the earth for several hours. Mm -hmm. And that was the real first contact I got. Uh, how did you feel? I mean, how did you get the telepathy? You see, if I have to explain that, it's somehow difficult. Mm -hmm. It was like a knowing, and at the same time, like a, a voice. Mm -hmm. Voice could hear in yeah. your head. Yeah, but not on that way. How I can hear you if you speak now with me? Mm -hmm. It was something else, but I don't can explain it. And uh, what did he say to you? They told me, or he told me that man. I was thinking about him, like that. That he is looking like a patriarch. And he told me that he is coming from very far in the universe, from other sun systems, from other stars. Mm -hmm. And that they will bring here some wisdom to teach the people here on Earth mm -hmm. for a good natural life, humanity, friendship, love and everything. Mm. Yeah, and and then, then that contact with that old man was going on for 11 years. Oh. After that time he left. And what was the name of the old man? Uh, his name was Svart. So uh, what about the first contact? I mean the old man. Yeah. He belongs to the Pleiadian. Pleiadian. Yeah. And, uh, why the why he stopped to come in here? The uh, spot you mean? Right. Uh, just a year ago, I came to know that he at that time, when he was gone for all the time, that he died. Oh, I see. And then three hours later, I got a other voice in my head from a girl, and there too I got then a, a contact, and two that was going on for other 11 years, up to the year 1964. Askett would become Billy's primary contact as he traveled throughout the Middle East. Although she is depicted here in this rare photograph, Meyer has released very little information concerning the 11-year training period that preceded the Palladian contacts. To get that picture, I had uh, to ask, and I got the permission to to shut them because she didn't return to Earth. Mm -hmm. If they stay here, it's impossible to get the picture from them. I see. They don't want to shut any picture from them if they stay and are working here and there. The Meyer family photo album contains numerous old but clear stills that were taken in India of luminous balls. These unusual objects dotted the night skies with brilliant bursts of concentrated light. Some were taken during daylight hours, such as this one with a person in the foreground and eight double sphere objects flying over the New Delhi railway station. One of the most spectacular photos shows a disc-shaped craft hovering over the Ashoka Ashram. Billy reported that this was Ascot ship. Mm -hmm. And then the contact stopped for the third 11 years, and then it started again by the 29th of January, 1975. The 
people from today, but I have contact with them from the Pleiades, is Semyazi. Mm -hmm. She was the first girl who came when I got the first contact. And are they coming uh, from the one planet? Or the they call the their planet by the name Era. Mm -hmm. And it belongs to the star picture of Pleiades. It's mm -hmm. so about 500 light years from the Earth. Oh. In the big star picture of the Taurus. Billy explained that in the beginning, the primary reason for the contacts was simply to take the clearest photographs ever seen of IFOs identified flying objects. How could you, you know, take those photos? <laughs> That's a very funny thing. I have my film camera, my photo camera. Yes. If I go outside, the most of the time I carry them with me. Mm -hmm. But I never can get a picture mm -hmm. if I not get the order to shot one. Mm. If I can get the picture only by an order of the Pleiadian, and then I will get a real good picture. Did they tell you a reason why they order to take a picture? <laughs> For proof. Now, uh, when you take a picture, mm -hmm. uh, could you describe how you're going to do, how hmm. you do like this? Very easy. Yes. You know? That's a very simple old Japanese photo camera. Yes. I can turn here, you see? Yes. Oh. And that I can do very quick by one hand. That the single camera I can use. Now you, you took this picture from this side. Yeah. And you took two pictures? Yeah, two. The other a little bit. More to the right side, you see? Uh huh. This is like a little that. bit right side. The other I had. So. Yes. And that one. So. Uh huh. With this camera. Yeah. Yes. So you were sitting over here. Yeah, I, I was sitting here. Yes. I had my camera here, you know, and I was eating something. Mm -hmm. And then she came and I took the picture like that. Oh. It's very easy to use in one hand. Mm -hmm. I say that's the single one I can use. All the other they are too complicated because you need two hands to handle them. Just take this way. Yeah. It's very easy. That's very yeah. easy. I see. And it's very quick. And, uh, you know, when you, you are taking a picture, mm -hmm. there should be uh, many people walking on the road or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, living in the house mm -hmm. and, uh, or, you know, running the mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. They might see the same well, thing. You see, that's very funny. If you take this here, mm -hmm. I think that's now the ship. I'm staying here with my camera. Mm -hmm. Everything around the ship, up, down, behind, by sides, will be closed. Nobody can see anything. There is a free line only to see something through here, the camera, mm -hmm. or to my face, to my eyes. Mm -hmm. Then I'm staying here, get the picture, uh, to get the picture from the ship. You stay there by the lamp or by the tree. Mm -hmm. You can't see anything because there the sighting will be closed for you. How it only it? will be open this way to the camera. And this happens the most time. And how about this one? You, you use the tripod with this? With them, yeah. Yes. I put it on the right part, mm -hmm. then I have here an automatic, mm -hmm. and then it works. I see. And two, it's a camera, but I can 
handle by one hand only. Mm -hmm. Here. I see. That's the single one I can find. And uh, at that time, uh, when was it? It, uh, it was outgoing winter time, I think, 1976. Six. The same year after that. Uh, Young. Yeah. It was the same day. A uh, same day. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, yeah. how the uh, saucer coming? Um, um, we have got to go there to the front. Tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, you see there behind the mountain. Yes. About a third part from here to the mountain. Yes. The ship was moving from the left side to the right side. And uh -huh. Right side, left side, left side, right side. Mm -hmm. Always on that way. Yes. And then at later time before it left by sunset, it moves behind that tree. Mm -hmm. You have seen the picture, and there I got three pictures I by see. my photo camera. So okay. how many hours are together from uh, the beginning? All together, I've been here up for about two hours. Two hours? Yeah. How many pictures did you take? Uh, between 70, 90, 100, I don't know exactly. Hmm. Most of them I lost somewhere, stolen, I don't know. The film and photographs taken here on the windswept ridge of Hasenbol were the most impressive. After comparing the stills taken in 1976 with the actual location, Billy and Junichi walk and measure the site. The distance from the camera to the tree was 52 yards. The height of the tree was 31 feet and the diameter was 21 feet which visually correlated to the reported size of the beam ship. When it was going down the sun, also by the sunset, mm -hmm. it moves here behind, a mm -hmm. few meters behind the tree, and then I got here three pictures. Oh. And the sun was somewhere there behind over the horizon. And how many minutes it stayed here? Oh, this was maybe... 20 seconds, 30 seconds, not more. Mm -hmm. And in that time I got these three pictures. It was maybe, I don't know exactly, maybe five meters behind, three meters behind, I don't know. And when was it, this one? Uh, that was 1976, I think. Mm. 76? Yeah. It should be autumn. It was evening time, mm -hmm. but the time I don't remember exactly. But I think it's a very huge one, like this. Mm -hmm. And where was the uh, UFO? The saucer? Uh, about three to five meters here, somewhere behind here. the tree. Yes. Yeah, somewhere here up. Oh. And nothing behind the tree. There is nothing behind the tree. A deep valley, that's all. Right. But this ship is very huge, mm -hmm. maybe seven meter. Seven meter across. This is a scenery when what which you take on the UFO itself. So. Yeah, when it was hanging there over the hill. Yeah. Now there was up a couple of trees, cut the trees. Yes. 
was it Freudian, Freudian or Freudian? Yeah, it was Semyazi. Semyazi. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you heard her voice? Yeah, in my head by telepathic way. I see. And uh, how was the size? How big was it? Uh, seven meters. Seven meters? Yeah. Have you All seen? the chips, what uh, she has, mm -hmm. they are by seven meters in diameter. Have you seen the inside of the interior of the UFO? Yeah, I many times was inside the ship. Mm -hmm. They took me up to other place and so. How did it look like? Oh. You have uh, many very, machines? Very, very, very modern thing, you know, with small televisions, mm -hmm. apparatus and everything. Mm -hmm. Looks like a factory. Oh. Uh, uh, a watching central, you know. Mm -hmm. I see. So do they have a bed to sleep? No, it isn't a bed. There are three seats in it. Mm. And they can change them and then they can sleep in it. Oh, I see. It's very big for him. Mm. So it should be somewhere around here? Oh, oh, I think it was more that side. Yes. Here about there's log was yes. Wood. Long wood, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the ship I think it was hanging somewhere here up. Yes. Between here and there. Between here and there, yeah. Yes. Oh. What's this about? 110, 120 meters from here to there. Did you try to close to it? Did you try to walk down to close to the uh, UFO? No, you see, if I take pictures, they always tell me you have to stay there. Oh. We will be here and you have to be there. Ah, I see. I can't go so close to get uh, some special things on the picture, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pull out. Oh. Months earlier, three 35-millimeter stills had been extensively analyzed. This one was coded the woodpile scene and had been examined by Neil Davis, a physicist and aerospace engineer. He tested them with a microdensitometer and determined that the analysis of the separations did not reveal any details that would cast doubt on their authenticity. The conclusion of his report states, Nothing was found in the examination that would cause me to believe the object in this photograph is anything other than a large object photographed some distance from the camera. The photographs were not the only physical evidence undergoing detailed scrutiny. Marcel Vogel, a senior scientist and chemist with IBM, had been carefully analyzing the tiny metal fragments Samyasa had given Billy. Metallurgical analysis had revealed the presence of the rare earth element thulium, but it was through the lens of a scanning electron microscope that Vogel made his most amazing discoveries. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself as a scientist. If I were to take these combinations and put it into a furnace, melt it, mm -hmm. then pour it out and pull a little ingot, I would see the, all of these elements present there mm -hmm. in any one area. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I see this discrete bits of material. Now, it can only happen by some form of a cold fusion process where you have the elements present mm -hmm. and you fuse them together so they still maintain their identity, but they interpenetrate into one another. Mm -hmm. It's also a challenge because I showed it to one of my friends who was a metallurgist, and he shook his head. He said, I don't see how it can be put together. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are right now. And I think it's important that those of us who are in the scientific world sit down and do some serious study on these things instead of putting it off as figments of people's imagination. Could I... Uh could I say 
this material is extraterrestrial? It doesn't look like anything that we've made here. At this moment, I would feel very much inclined to accept what was given to me as being true. I see. I respect the people I have met so far, their integrity, their willingness to work. Mr. Delatosa in his work on photography and Mr. Stevens, the way he has done his best to give me specimens. We have all done this for one thing, to serve and to find out what, what truth there is to this. At Bokta Hornley on the 26th of March, 1976, Billy took a remarkable series of 35 millimeter stills depicting two distinctively different beam ship variations. The purpose of this demonstration was to allow Billy the opportunity to obtain what he calls photo proofs by photographing beam ships with known objects such as this tree branch. But the 35 millimeter stills were only a portion of the photographic evidence gathered that day at Bachtelhornley. Billy took several minutes of 8 millimeter movie footage as well. Here, the film has been cut. The tampering took place when Billy allowed an individual in Germany to borrow it for personal examination. Irregardless, this footage was extraordinary because it offered a rare glimpse of a Variation 3 beam ship and two remote controlled scout ships, all in the same scene. The bobbing is due to the craft riding the waves of the Earth's magnetic surface, very much like that of a boat on the waves of an ocean. One of the stills taken at Bachtel Hornley would undergo computer enhancement, allowing the opportunity to study the intricate details of this beam ship. In June of 1975, at Berg Rumlikon, Billy took over 75 stills of this Variation 2 ship. The sun can clearly be seen reflecting off the craft's metallic skin. And once again, Billy had his movie camera. How about this? Is this the same one, same yeah, day? The same day. It's all the same film. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first place in Rumlikon we was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And here the ship is jumping away. There the film isn't cut on when that place when the ship jumps away. It's nearly a speed of light and you can't see anything. It is here and it goes. Japanese analysis of this footage would reveal through super slow motion that an unexplained light shift occurs three frames prior to the beam ship's dematerialization and rematerialization. It is believed that the craft is emitting some form of energy three twentieths of a second prior to its disappearance or reappearance. One of the most important contact sites was less than five minutes from the Meyer farm and located in a nature preserve. Obersadeleg offered a unique look at a complete sequence of stills. These scenes taken in the spring of 1975 were coded the tree line series. This photo was selected for detailed analysis because it offered excellent reference points for computer triangulation. Trees to the front, side, and rear. Measurements were taken from the camera's point of view to where Junichi and Billy stood, near where the beam ship was reported to hover. The distance between objects and points of reference were checked and rechecked for accuracy. Then the measurements were fed into a computer, and the edges of known objects, such as the trees, are translated into pixels. Since these measurements are known, the number of pixels in the edge of the unknown object, the craft, gives its distance. The beam ship is determined to be precisely where Billy said it was, and mathematical triangulation gives its size, seven meters, 
were about 21 feet in diameter. Junichi, like our team, had been fascinated by the Meyer photography, yet cautious. He had investigated UFOs around the world and never before seen photographs or movie footage this detailed. It seemed too good to be true. Yet when questions arose, there was always another piece of footage to stir the sense of wonder. Close examination of this footage clearly shows the craft moving behind the large tree. When the size of the beam ship is compared to that of the tree and the farmhouse, it becomes obvious that it would be impossible to suspend it with strings. In addition, the top of this enormous tree is seen to move as the craft passes over it. This movement can be attributed to the backwash of air created by the beam ship. With a full day scheduled, we left the farmhouse early to visit more contact sites. As we rounded a curve, Billy halted the Land Rover to point out his native village, Hindwell. As the cameraman began to film the valley, sounds of a small aircraft could be heard over the natural sounds of the Swiss countryside, and another mystery begins to unfold. Wanting to re-examine the site at Hassenbull, Junichi and his crew began lining up Billy's shots with the natural landmarks in the area. But as he begins the interview, the mysterious airplane returns, ruining the soundtrack and forcing a decision to move on to the next site, Schmarbuhl. After two hours of driving, we reached the village of Schmarbuhl. Filming had just begun when Junichi interrupted the interview. Is that, um... And there's a, uh, you know, there is a airplane out there. A train that uh, every time we sh take a picture, we take a videotape, mm -hmm. you know, the airplane time. Always our airplanes are on the no. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> they are watching us. Once again discouraged, we traveled to Winkle Riot, some 50 miles to the southeast. And the uh, next thing, next one is the, is somewhere from here. That's in that direction, yeah. You see here the saddle in the, uh, yes. in the forests there on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the ship a little bit more left by side. Yes. Now it was cloudy at that time. It was cloudy at that day. Now we can hear the uh, sounds of airplane again. Yeah. <sighs> it's always the same. You see, when I got all my pictures, my films, all the times were was their airplanes. Mm. Practically by every place where I shot pictures. Okay. Oh. Junichi was visibly frustrated by the uninvited intruder. Meyer was obviously under surveillance, but he had been for some time. Lee remembers. And he hasn't taken any. Uh, Jim, he hasn't taken any daylight footage for two years. Mm -hmm. There's been several reasons to that, as we understand it. One has been the fact that two years ago, Billy was under heavy surveillance. Mm -hmm. We don't know who it was. All we know, there was a Volkswagen. It was equipped with uh, what appeared to be uh, parabolic microphones, maybe some form of ground-to-ground -ground radar. I don't know. But they followed him everywhere he went. Hmm. Every time he went out for a contact, he had a shadow with him. Billy's problems actually began in 1976 with the first release of his story and some of the photos to the European press. Soon, every major magazine and newspaper featured an article on Billy Meyer. These sensational press releases were responsible for bringing in hordes of well-wishers, friends, curiosity seekers, and in overall, a general public seeking more information. But it also attracted the negative element. After a close call on his life, Billy armed himself and became less trusting. So uh, finally, uh, he just quit. They stopped having contacts in daylight hours, and they moved him up 
early evening, and eventually they went into the early wee hours of the morning. Herbert Runkel recalls one such event. It was uh, near Hinville. It was in the night, near one o'clock in the morning, and Billy was going to a contact, and Semyaza told him that after the contact, she will give a demonstration for the people. And when the contact was finished, uh, we can see there are many other people also stay there. We can see the ship is rising out of the wood, going to the sky, stopped. It was a dark red light, mm -hmm. and then stopped, going to the right, going to the left. And I have a camera with me, a Super 8 movie mm -hmm. camera. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get it in the objective, but I was so <laughs> nervous. Uh -huh. Also present at the demonstration was Hans Schutzbach. He too was nervous, but he did manage to take this interesting night footage. Here the beam ship jumps, as was described by Herbert earlier, becoming brighter, then disappearing. Some of the best stills taken during the demonstration belong to an Austrian man, Guido Musburger. Another photograph he took that evening was even more intriguing. Guido's daughter, Anita, holds the picture as he traces the distinct outline of the beam ship. Guido's photo remained an oddity until a few months later when a second unusual photograph appeared. Wendell explains. Yeah, a stranger seeing somebody off on an airliner at Kloten Airport here in Zurich had simply taken a picture of the airliner with a Polaroid camera. When the picture came out of the camera, this is what she got. She put it in an envelope with a note saying that this thing happened at the airport. She didn't know anything about these things, and she didn't want anybody to know who she was. And she put it in an envelope and mailed it to the newspaper with no return address. Mm -hmm. The newspaper published the picture, inviting her to get in contact with them so they could pay for it. But the picture is unique because it has a similar space-shaped spacecraft. It has a field around it and an expanded field here. Mm -hmm. The picture was taken to a local photo photography shop. Uh, a man recognized in it as an expert here in Zurich who looked at the picture and said, he couldn't account for any way that this picture could get on this film, on Polaroid film. Mm -hmm. The lady did not remember seeing anything when she took the picture except the airplane. There were other witnesses, too. Most were disbelievers at first, until they had their own experiences. When Calliope, or Bobby as she is called, first learned of the contacts, she questioned her husband's sanity. In Sachsen-Sipetzky, in Juni, 1945. Today, after many personal sightings, she finds the encounter's routine and feels that the Palladian message to mankind is far more important than the evidence. The Meyer children openly discuss their sightings. They're proud of their father's contacts. Atlantis displays a painting of an object that he, his older sister Gilgamesha, and his younger brother Methuselah observed while waiting for their father to return from a contact. And then, ha, then, ha, and they flew. Is this so over? Then we did so. And then is this ausgegangen. Jacobus Bertschinger works on the farm and has witnessed many things. See, had sich deep top zweck gemacht. Nach dem dass er wieder Retour gekommen ist, nach 20 Stunden. Das erste, was mir aufgefallen ist, als er nach Hause ist, hat er so einen richtig fünftägigen Bart gehabt. Displaying an artist sketch that illustrates one such experience, he shrugs the numerous daytime and evening events off as no big thing. Engelbert Wachter and his wife Maria were drawn to the case by a magazine article that appeared in Switzerland. Wir sind, respektive der Billy, ist dann von der Semiase dirigiert worden durch hunderte von Strössli und Wägli, bis wir in die Nähe vom eigentlichen Kontaktort gekommen sind. After tracking Billy down and spending an afternoon with him, they came away convinced of his sincerity. 
Later, both of them would have their own personal experiences. Elsie Moser is a schoolteacher living in the Zurich area. She first heard of the Meyer experiences from a friend in the summer of 1976. Mm -hmm. So after you saw the many, uh, many things? Then, yes, not just the first time I realized that it, I could see it. Mm -hmm. Then the second time too, and so I'm, I'm sure. Since early 1975, over 40 people from all different walks of life have at one time or another been part of the Meyer experience. Herbert Runkel came from Munich not only to act as a translator for Junichi, but also to describe as a witness his many experiences. I come out on this place yeah. and from this front, Billy and one woman was coming. They made a walk in the morning and I go here, here, yeah, there, oh, yeah. and then I light my cigarette and look around to this area, mm -hmm. and then one light switch on, mm -hmm. maybe here, yes, and it's going this way over the house, mm -hmm. and near the antenna, it was so bright. Oh, how big yes. was it? How, this one. Oh. Yes. Oh. Like a small ball. I see. And it was a quite cold light, mm -hmm. very intensive, yes. Uh -huh. And then the object is going w away over the woods. Mm -hmm. And since going away, the light uh, will be Dim small, mm -hmm. dimmed, yes. And on this time, Billy get a telepathic contact mm -hmm. and Samyaza sends greetings to all persons on this area here. Mm. And uh, did you see the object itself? Or? The object itself, not clearly. It was a very intensive light, you know. Mm -hmm. It was so... I need glasses, maybe. Oh, <laughs> yes. it's all right. But uh, the light was very concentrated. Mm -hmm. The light is... don't go away. It was mm -hmm. concentrated on a point and like this. About and did it lit up somewhere here? Nothing. No? Nothing. It was quite dark. It was brightly sky. Uh -huh. There are many stars. And it was a little bit uh, the sunrise, you know, in summer. Did you hear the noise or sound? Nothing. Oh. It was quietness. I see. Yeah. And is that uh, the first time you saw the UFO? No, this was the uh, fourth time. Uh -huh. Yes. Fourth time? The fourth time, but the first time on this area, on this place here. Oh, oh yeah. where is it? Uh, this, this one? On this part? place. The other sites will be seen in the near of Hinwil. Mm, where is it? Uh, it's about 25 kilometers from here. Uh -huh. It was a, is it, it is a little village. Billy was living there for some years. Oh. And he changed his flat and come here in the April of 1977. Hmm. Yes. So a year before, yeah. yeah. He moved to here. He moved to here. I see. So how many years did you investigate? I know Billy since exactly since the 14th of July, 1976. Mm. I read in a magazine about these things, and I don't believe it at first. Mm -hmm. And I come here mm -hmm. to meet Billy, to talk with him. And then I saw many, many photos, films, and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's very incredible. Mm. And now, what do you think? No, I think, I can't think, I say it's real. Mm -hmm. I saw the objects by myself and many, many other things. Herbert had filmed the landing tracks shortly after the event had taken place. The footprints of the Palladium beam ships were unique. They had landed on tripod legs, each having a disc-shaped pad or shoe that left the grass and all other vegetation swirled down in a counterclockwise motion.
the counterclockwise print baffled the observers, including Billy. Until, in a follow-up contact, Billy posed the question to Sinyasa, and she explained that the round surface area of the support legs also vibrate as part of the entire spaceship in a spiral-shaped anti-gravity oscillation. Each ship has four such vortex centers, three at the landing pads and the fourth at the bottom center of the ship itself. This would explain the many single footprints observed in the snow during winter contacts. At this site, which Billy recorded on 8mm movie film, the grass continued to grow in a counterclockwise motion for over two and a half months. When asked why, Samyasa explained that the anti-gravity oscillation of the beam ship is far more powerful than the normal gravitational field of planet Earth. Thus, the new force field overcomes the old gravitational field and creates in the plant life a gravitational shift, which the plant life assumes to be correct. This counter-gravity force then lingers for a period of time until it becomes weakened through age and the Earth's gravity once again can take command. On numerous occasions, the Pleiadians had allowed demonstrations for Billy and his friends to record the sounds of the beam ships, while the crafts remained invisible to observation. This technical phenomena first occurred at this site near Hinwil in 1975. Billy explains. The ship was about uh, 60 or 80 yards mm -hmm. above me. Mm -hmm. And my people, my witnesses, was 116 meters away. Mm -hmm. For them, it was impossible to see the ship. Mm -hmm. They only heard the voice of them, mm -hmm. very, very loud. They, they got a headache, you know. Mm -hmm. I was in directly under the ship. And I have it seen in the sky. How could they do it? I don't know. <laughs> they have uh, some invisible net. This invisible net may have been responsible for Billy's numerous disappearances during contacts. Jacobus and Herbert recount one of their experiences that took place in the summer of 77. He disappeared out there. Then we listen the sound of the ship mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I run to Jacobus and said to him, please stop the tractor mm -hmm. because we want to listen to the sound. Mm -hmm. And 10 minutes after we start our work again, Billy come up this hill from the ground and say, come with me, I show you the landing tracks. Mm. They brought me back and the ship was setting down on the earth and there are three landing tracks. And I take my photo camera and goes down and made photos by these landing tracks. When the Billy disappeared out there, uh, did you search the, that area? Yes, I think at first he is running around this corner this way to the wood, mm -hmm. yes, but he don't come out from these trees. Oh, I see. And the time was too short. He's not an Olympic gamer, you know. Mm -hmm. It was some seconds only. Mm -hmm. And he must be disappeared on this corner down there. Over a dozen witnesses, including members of Billy's family, have confirmed similar experiences. Elsie Moser recalls, A few friends of us went inside the house, and then there came along a star. Billy got up from his chair and walked over the place and watched that little star, 
and I went too. And then that little star moved like this, and suddenly it grows to a big light. Mm. And off it went, mm -hmm. away. And then we heard an aeroplane, and then Billy made this, and this meant he has to go to a contact. Mm. Then he put his shoes on and went outside here along this uh, little road. Mm -hmm. And I could see him from there going down, mm -hmm. but then a little later I walked and I couldn't see him anymore mm. here. I, he, he was no, he wasn't there anymore. And then I saw the light going back after this way. Oh. Yes. One of these mysterious disappearances involved a member of our investigative team. They were all sitting there having coffee, and all of a sudden Billy jumped up, ran out that door there. Wendell ran forward, came to this door, ran outside. It was raining. Not very hard, but it was drizzling. Looked to his right, looked to his left. No Billy, nothing. Oh, he went out. He disappeared. <coughs> he disappeared. Mm. About an hour after that, uh, the phone rang. It was Billy Meyer. He was calling from Rila or one of the cities on the other side of the mountains. Mm. And he says, come and get me and bring Mr. Stevens. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was Jacobus, Poppy, Wendell. They jumped into the, at that time, they had a green Volkswagen. They jumped into that and they drove for about an hour pulled into the small little village. There was a guest house there. Mm -hmm. Picked Billy up. He didn't have any mud on his boots, mm -hmm. no water on his clothes. They brought him back here, and uh, he said he had a contact. Oh, that's very strange. That's very Completely unusual. Completely dry. Completely dry, uh -huh. no mud on his boots, nothing. What was to become the most dramatic episode of what Junichi referred to as the invisible net began on an innocent note in the spring of 1976 in a small valley known as Schmarbuhl. A demonstration had been underway for Billy to film and record the craft sound when an uninvited visitor appeared. From there behind, from the uh, south, came a fighter, a yes. mirage fighter. Mm -hmm. And always he was going on to Semyon's ship. She always jumps away. Mm. And that fighting was going on over the whole area from there behind. Mm. But always if the fighter comes near her, 100, 150 yards, then she jumps away. Mm. And after 20 minutes, she left was gone and the fighter too left them. Oh. And I was staying here and took pictures. was coordinating the scientific research in the United States. He coded this photograph, the jet fighter scene, and turned it over to science investigator and computer analyst Jim Dilatoso. Jim had analyzed over a dozen of the Meyer photographs, searching for strings, overlay, or double exposure trickery. None were found. Further analysis showed that the distance of the jet was over 2,000 yards away from the lens of the camera. And the size of the craft was about 22 feet in diameter. But the most interesting discovery came when an energy field was detected, originating from the craft and creating an unusual pattern around it. Here Jim traces this field, showing the energy engulfing the Swiss Mirage fighter. The computer analysis report concluded the Mirage fighter is definitely 
inside the energy field emitted by the spacecraft. Did you ask to the Air Force about this? By Many Tampo? times, mm -hmm. but two by, by, by other sightings and so. But always they say, sorry, we don't know anything about <laughs> that. Yeah, I see. You see, we was doing several tests to see what's happened with the Swiss Army. Mm -hmm. Our group was ready up big balance by 80 cubic meter. Very, very big balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and outside we put on it silver paper mm -hmm. to reflect the weaves of the radar. And near the airport port. We let them go into the air and then we send the people from us to the Air Force people to ask them if they have seen something on the radar or by their own eyes. No, nothing. <laughs> it's usual <laughs> answer for the Air Force. You see, today it's possible with uh, computers to check up pictures, uh -huh. negatives, mm -hmm. and everything, films. Of course, that's possible, but you see, you can't go over all the world to tell each human being. Mm -hmm. This happened now on that way, that's now the truth. You can get the analysis from a computer, mm -hmm. but to the people not will believe. Right, right. So the if they see the ship by themselves, mm -hmm. they get the picture, then for them it is true. But right. if somebody else get the picture, they say that's a fake only. Right, right. So did they tell you why they are not going to show up himself, I mean, they s themselves, you know, why they don't come uh, visibly mm -hmm. to the people. Yeah, you see, they told me different reasons. One of them is they thinks and means and says if they burn over the sky at day or night time, mm -hmm and the people will see them, the earth people here, they will come to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will turn over in their mind or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And it will come a panic. Mm -hmm. The other thing, they say they have to be very careful about their own weaves from their own body and about the weaves from the earth humans. If they come together, they will turn over in their mind because they are living in every case on a very much higher level than the people here. And if they go to show them by their flying around the earth, the humans, the earth humans, they will try to catch them. Mm -hmm. They will, by the Air Force, send up planes, fighters mm -hmm. against them. And about all that, they are very afraid. Mm -hmm. But I think they have, uh, you know, uh, much better science than us. Mm -hmm. So they can, you know, protect themselves mm -hmm. for, from, the, from the Air Force attack. Yes, of course, that's very easy for them. But, you see, I think it isn't useful. Mm -hmm. Why they shall show them to the humans if they go to fight against them? Mm -hmm. It will make trouble for them, for us humans from this earth, and maybe for other ones. 
because the Pleiadians, they aren't the single one who comes to Earth from other stars. Japan, two months earlier, Nippon Television Network aired their special on the Meyer case to an audience of over 30 million viewers. Response had been so overwhelming that NTV asked Junichi to return to gather more information. We were saddened to see the deterioration of Billy's health, brought on in part by stress from the hard farm life, but primarily from the fact that someone had tried to assassinate him, not once, but several times. It, it was about 10 o'clock at night yeah. on the 10th of May, uh -huh. 1980, and Billy and I had just finished making some notes inside. And we walked out here, back down, in the couch, together here to get some fresh air. And then I got pain to my right backside, and I was hole? turning a little bit on this way to right side and then came the pain very strong to the other side and I move it back yeah. and in, th in that moment we heard the shot and I feel something here near the head pulling mm -hmm. into the vault and there was uh, coming out the, the, the dirt of yeah. the wall and I was wishing them down from my head and then we left here to run inside to get the uh, alarm turn and the pistol to run out again to see what's happened around if you can find somebody you couldn't find no oh yeah. and after you came here did you find the bullet yeah we was looking on the floor yeah check it up everything but uh we can't find a bullet, and then came my daughter, Gilgamesha, uh -huh. kicked away the sofa here, and here, behind them, down on the floor, was this bullet. Oh. I think it's a caliber by 7.5 millimeter. Yes. Uh, what is this uh, bullet called? Uh, uh, the nearest size we have is 30 caliber, but it's 7.7 .7 meters, and Billy thinks it's a pistol bullet. It's a soft-nosed bullet with no jacket. Mm. It spreads out when it hits. It's a very oh. weak material, very soft. So it's called dum-dum? Yeah. Well, that's what we'd call a dum-dum bullet, yes. Dum-dum bullet. Mm -hmm. oh. It's fit for this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I see. So I think it's correct. I see. Oops. When did it happen? This happened about a minute after 10 o'clock at night in the dark. I mean, a date. On the 10th of May, 1980. This last this seventh, seventh this year. Time. This year, yes, sir. So only uh, what one month ago. No, that it was uh, uh, May. It was about May, five months uh, ago. Five months ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it was just uh, one inch. It was, oh, we measured, it was, le it hit the wall less than eight inches from the center of his eyes at eyebrow level. You can see the, the hole is just about eyebrow level. There. So if he, you know, uh, if he hadn't had, had the pain, yeah. he'd have been hit in the head. But is it normal uh, to have the pain on your back? Uh, still, it hold it on for about three, four minutes, and then it left on that quick way how it was coming. Oh. You see, by very big danger, mm -hmm. I get always pain in my back, oh. and then I know there will be coming something. He said that he has had this pain before when, he, when danger is imminent. We reconstructed the next morning, and we find the footsteps behind the tree there up Brown. three or four. Right. Old friends was there. Mm -hmm. oh. Who do you think's doing this, Billy? I don't know. Someone foolish. <laughs> this was the seventh time. The seventh time Billy has been shot at. There was another time when a man shot at him from nearby here. And the other time I got the shot here in. But I was warned about one week before for three times by dreams. 
and then Jacobus he make me uh, metal plates and yes. then I put it under the jacket because in the dream I have seen exactly where I will be shot. Mm -hmm. And then at morning at four o'clock about I think it was very very dark there was uh, the boat Schutzbach Hans and Konrad Schutzbach and Jacobus together with me here behind the hills in Saddle Egg mm -hmm. and then falls a shot and mm -hmm. he came exactly here in on the metal plate. Uh -huh. Made a hole in his jacket, dented the plate, and ricocheted out another hole. And then some few minutes later, I have seen far away a soft shadow. Then I took my pistol and shut him down the hat from his He shot head. at the running man and, and uh, shot the hat right off of his head. Another close call came when an assassin's bullet hit and lodged in a diary Billy was carrying in his pocket. And another when a bullet creased his sheepskin coat. As in all cases except one, he attributes dreams and other warnings as Pleiadian protection. But the first attempt on his life caught everyone by surprise. There were no warnings. Uh, this happens in Hinville. Mm -hmm. I was working in the first floor in my office. I had there a printing machine and it was about uh, between seven and eight o'clock mm -hmm. in the evening, I think. And I just was working under the light lamp by the printing machine. Mm -hmm. And then I heard a crashing from the window. And in the same moment, I felt a wind here in the front of my head, very, very close. Yes. And uh, I was a uh, bully. Back. And when I was looking on the floor, I have seen it was a bullet. Oh. Uh, a small one by uh, caliber 22. And I was running down out of the house. First, I took my pistol, but she was checking up everything there, but it wasn't possible to find somebody. It was, at that time, dark night. It was uh, winter and very early yeah. night. Who, who did it? I was asking then at later time Semyaza if she can find out something, but it wasn't possible for her. Then at later years, when we was living here up in Hinterschmidrütti, I got a letter from a woman, mm. and she told me the whole story, what's happened there, and told me that she was that human who was shooting oh. after me to kill me because because she was a uh, religious very religious fanatically and was thinking i'm something like a made out of the, of uh, of the devil and she has have to kill me oh. that was her story and today she belongs to us, not to the directly group, but uh, she is a, a woman who is very interested now in all these cases about the UFOs and the teachings and everything. And every two, three months, mm -hmm. I get the phone call from her or I come her see if I leave the place here and maybe in the next town or in Vetsikon or somewhere, I can meet her. I see. And uh -huh. so we have uh, contact today. Yeah. At first she was a, a horrible enemy, uh -huh. <laughs> and now a good friend. All right. <laughs> Thank you.
Another pressure point was the chilling experience he had with an unknown form of energy that turned night into day. At first, when I saw it, it was here up behind the hill. Yeah. And then I left very quick up to the clouds. Yeah. And then it came here down over the parking place. And then it left to this side. Oh, I see. And uh, what is this? What do you think is this? What it is really, I don't know. Mm. I know only it's a, a spaceship. Uh, a ship uh, made out of energy, not metal or uh, a hard material, but what it is really, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, different from different from the from the, the Pleiadian ships. The strange energy form moved west to east, manifesting a brilliant intensity that illuminated the distant mountains and meadows while at the same time, it constantly changed form. Did you ask to the Pleiadian, what is this? Yeah, they didn't know <laughs> what's really happened with these ships and which kind of energy they are. Oh, I see. So this must be energy. That's real energy. I see. That I was told by the Pleiadians, but they too didn't know they Which know. kind of it? Oh, so oh, they, don't they know. know only uh, these ships belongs to small people by uh, about uh, seventy or seventy-five hmm. centimeters. Yes, but com coming from the another planet. Uh, from very far from a other galaxy. Oh, I see. But they don't know them. This incident would remain a mystery. However, tired and recuperating from bronchial pneumonia, Billy did provide answers to many questions in an extensive interview, beginning with, what do the Pleiadians look like? They look like ah. humans from the Earth. Yes. And they... looks not strange not like uh, half animals or half humans. They look like really humans. Is there any slight difference between... There is a small difference only with their air lips here. Yes. They are a little bit longer than our one. Oh. How long is it? Oh, maybe one and a half or two centimeter longer. But that's quite different from human to human, it's not by each one the same. And by uh, us kept, yeah. they comes a little bit more to the front. Oh. They don't go straight down, yeah. they come a little bit more to the front. But each time you get uh, telepathy, you know, mm -hmm. and you go to somewhere with the, mm -hmm. you know, show uh, you, and after that, what happens? They land? Not always. <coughs> yeah. Sometimes they take me up by uh, antigraph. When you go up by uh, anti-gravity, do you go up a beam of light? Something like that. If you have uh, a channel and you blow up mm -hmm. wind. A wind? and put in a feather, mm -hmm. you have exactly the same. Describe what you feel when you've been teleported back. Maybe you've been sitting in your office and you've been clear of mind and spirit. Uh, for, for a moment, some few seconds, I'm a little bit swindly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Are you out of breath and, and tired? A little, a little so and a little bit tired and mm. somehow a little bit swindly. Mm. But it takes a few seconds only. Mm. After maximum <coughs> 10 seconds, everything will be clear again. I asked Billy yesterday a question I've wanted to know for a long time. I asked him if any of us sitting here were with Billy 
and the Palladian decided to take him mm -hmm. on board, mm -hmm. and we wanted to go on board. Could we go the same way he goes? And he said, mm -hmm. yes, we could, providing two things. Mm -hmm. One was mentally you're mm -hmm. prepared for it and you want to go, and the second you mentioned was psychically. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the word we kept coming up with was psyche, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that's the right word. You have to be absolutely clear in yourself. Mm -hmm. Head and heart. Only head and heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many rooms they have? There is one room only. Only? Yeah. So they don't have a toilet? There is a toilet, but I don't know where. I never use it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take any photographs inside of Sannyasis? They practically was all black. I can't get a clear picture. And they told me they was trying <laughs> for years with our film material, what we have here on Earth, to get good pictures. Hmm. They never can do it. Maybe there's a radiation level or uh, some kind of frequency level that distorts it. Can you describe the windows in the spacecraft? They're very complex. <laughs> That's a funny thing. It looks like glass mm -hmm. and it looks like metal. Mm -hmm. And in each different atmosphere you enter, the color will be changed automatically. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere like on Earth the windows will be colored by uh, orange. Mm -hmm. By a uh, methane atmosphere, it will be, I'm not sure now, <laughs> but I think yellow. Methane, yellow, methane shows yellow. Mm -hmm. oh. But I'm not, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And you can see through the wood. You can see wall. through the window. There is the whole thing a window. It's metal but you can see through them like normal glass. What they told me here on Earth shall be about uh, eight different human races. Mm -hmm. They are here exploring, they are here study, they are here uh, doing uh, uh, watching duties and so. Mm -hmm. But there will be each year round about 3,000 uh, UFOs mm -hmm. from outside of our solar system. Oh. Some of them, they are coming from billions of uh, light years to Earth for exploring only or to get visiting other ones who are living here. Living? Mm -hmm. By these uh, eight different human races who, who uh, have stations here on Earth. Oh. Or then they had some troubles with their ships. Mm -hmm. So many kind of space people <coughs> are coming. About 3,000 different, different. Uh, types each year. 3,000 different types of UFO are coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. <laughs> One of the researchers calculated that uh, there may be as many as 70,000 reports in a year worldwide. UFO pictures, up to this point at least, are accidental. They happen once and they're gone. So some of them are trying to destroy our Earth or no. no. They have such a high civilization and they are with the technical evolution mm -hmm. so much higher up than we here on the Earth who has the possibility to cross the space by very, very long distances. Mm -hmm and many light years, they for sure not will be coming here to make trouble, to start a war, mm -hmm. or to do any other wrong thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if there is
it's a war here. It's, it's very easy to stop the, you know, the whole system of uh, nuclear weapons for them. It's very for easy, them, right? it's very easy, but they will do only it in that moment. Yes. If it will be dangerous for themselves oh, or I for see. the whole system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our system or other life forms, they not have to do anything with mm -hmm. the Earth people or the planet I Earth. I so if we want to destroy ourselves, it's our own business. Yeah. But if we start affecting other civilizations and other life yeah. forms, then it becomes their business. Mm -hmm. I see. So, uh, <coughs> Now you see, they, they, if they want to change something here on Earth, on the Earth themselves or by the human beings, they can do it on one way only, mm -hmm. by force. Mm -hmm. Right. And to use force, it's yeah. for them a <laughs> forbidden thing. So what is the reason why they are coming? They feel into themselves a duty because the humans on this earth from today are practically made out of their forebears and other side we are here practically brothers and sisters of them. They feel into themselves a duty because there are two points who are very important, or they are very important. That's the materialism way and the spiritual way. Mm -hmm. They have to work together. Mm -hmm. Not only one of them have to work. And to change this again to the real way, to the connected way by materialism way and spiritual way, they come here again to teach the earth people. How That's the only reason they have. That's their own saying. Not to to bring war to earth or to bring peace to the human here on earth by themselves. Mm -hmm. If we want peace and knowledge and love and everything here on earth, we have to change everything by ourselves as human beings from this earth. On February 3rd, 1986, Billy celebrated his 49th birthday. To a great degree, his life and those of his family and friends have been traumatized by the experiences. However, the story of his encounters has touched millions of people on this planet, opening minds to the possibility that we Earth humans may not be the only thinking beings in the universe. With the Pleiadians acting as observers and occasionally nudging our senses in the right direction, perhaps we can do the rest ourselves.